Okay, can everyone see the screen? Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like it's a true honor to have everyone on the call and the fact that you um, committed to this is really an honor for our health department and everyone else. So um, as everyone knows, this is the COVID-19 um, town hall meeting, which is virtual, which is another challenge, but we're going to do it anyway. So um, just to make everyone aware, um, I welcome all of the attendees. Right now, you do not have your microphones or your videos on. So we have a couple of solutions so you can add, uh, ask the questions as you need to. You can use the Q&A button and it is located um, down there at the bottom of the Zoom. And it's also uh, a raise your hand option where you can use that in case you can't type in any questions in the Q&A box. So if you want to, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can ask your questions as needed. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself and then I'll pass it on to Dr. Grundy. Uh, but my name is Natalie Sawyer and I am the Health Education Director for Southern Seven Health Department. Um, I am from this area. I grew up in Pulaski County and I now live and work in Alexander County. So this is something that is dear and near to my heart. And then of course, being at the health department in Southern Illinois with all of the challenges we've had as far as covering seven counties is even more close and dear and near to my heart. Um, so I'll keep that brief and that's my introduction. And Dr. Grundy, you can have the floor. Um, good evening. My name is Dr. Stacy Grundy. I am a research assistant professor at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine in the Department of Population Science and Policy. And I too am from the area. I'm born and raised in Alexander County. And whenever I can, I always try to reach back and to remind people that Southern Illinois exists. And so to bring whatever resources that I have, you know, back home. So I'm just very happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Grundy. I just wanted to give an opportunity in case anyone um, from NAACP wanted to say anything. I wanted to give them a really, really special shout out. Uh, Tyrone Coleman, he reached out to me and the health department to get this started. He's very passionate about the community. And of course he represents for the Alexander Pulaski uh, branch for NAACP. So that conversa conversation is what started this because of the concern of the low vaccination rates in some of our counties for Southern Illinois. So if anyone else wants to say anything or introduce yourselves, please either raise your hand or send us something in the chat box and we can make sure that you're unmuted. We do have a question from Miss Faith Miller. So I would I had the honor of meeting her at another uh, panelist type meeting. And she wants to know how we can share or invite others to jo join before it gets too far into the program. And that is a really good question. <laughs> so I have a couple of co-hosts on here with me or anybody that knows that answer. Yeah, they could share the link in the in the chat. Okay. Okay. All right, well, we'll go. I just shared a link to join the meeting in the uh, chat box. And um, you could also, people could be directed to visit our Facebook page. They will find a link there. It's our most recent post. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Okay. So first we want to give a disclaimer. Okay, next we'll give a disclaimer. Thank you, Amanda. We are letting everybody know that this is an educational and awareness type of event, but all of this content that's supplied in this town hall is just for informational purposes only. It's not intended to substitute for professional medical advice and it should not be relied on as health or personal advice. So if you have any deeper questions, please seek the guidance of your doctor or your health health care provider for any questions that you may have regarding your personal health and wellness. So we have to give that disclaimer. So that's that part. So I will go ahead and start with the introductions. 
and I have the honor of introdu introducing Dr. Damon Arnold. So Colonel Damon T. Arnold holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Howard University and a medical degree and Master of Public Health degree from the University of Illinois. He also holds a Master of Arts degree in Homeland and Defense Security Studies from the Center for Homeland Defense and Security at the Naval Post Postgraduate School War College. He serves as a adjunct professor in the University of Illinois College of Medicine and School of Public Health. He served as the director of the Illinois Department of Public Health from 2007 to 2011. He also served for 26 years in the Army National Guard and as the commander of the Illinois State Joint, Ta Joint Task Force Medical Command and a qualified Black Hawk helicopter flight surgeon. He was awarded three Army Commendation Medals and the highly coveted Military Legion of Merit Medal by President Barack Obama among his numerous military awards. He currently serves on the Illinois State Board of Health as the Policy Subcommittee Chairman and the State Health Assessment, State Health Improvement Plan, Implementation Team, <laughs> that's a long one. Um, he's been appointed by the Governor, Governor J.B. Prisker and he's also been working as a medical director for over six years at Healthcare Services Corporation, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Montana. So I was just a little intimidated just by reading the bio. So that is a lot of accomplishments and I'm sure that's just a slice. No, well, it's good to be the oldest one. They put me in first, <laughs> but we have three great doctors coming up <laughs> of four. So we put it in alphabetical order is what we did. We, we did it like in kindergarten and, and put it in alphabetical order. So welcome, Dr. Arnold. It's an honor to have you. Okay, next I will introduce Dr. Nagazi Azike. So Dr. Nagazi Azike is the director of the Illinois Department of Public Health the first black woman appointed to lead the 143 year old state agency. Dr. Zike is a board certified internist and a pediatrician who previously worked for the Cook County Department of Public Health, where she served for more than 15 years. She was also the medical director at the Cook County Juvenile Temporary Detention Center. Prior to joining Cook County Department of Public Health, Dr. Zike served as an Austin Health Center medical director where she actively engaged with the community on a variety of health initiatives. She also has delivered inpatient care at Stroger Hospital, I hope I pronounced that right, and primary and preventive care in community and school-based clinics. Dr. ZK is a nationally recognized expert in the area of healthcare with the juvenile detention and justice systems. A graduate, a graduate of Harvard University and the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, she is a certified correctional health professional and a diplomat of both the American Board of Internal Medicine and the American Board of Pediatrics. She is also an assistant professor of pediatrics at Rush Medical College. She is a recipient of numerous awards, including 2020 Lester H. McKeever Individual Service Award from the Chicago Urban League and the Health Innovator Award from Erie Family Health Center. An advocate for maintaining work-life balance particularly in challenging times, Dr. Zike is an avid tennis player and a reader and is fluent in Spanish and French. We would like to welcome Dr. Zike to the town hall today. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Next, I will hand it over to Dr. Grundy to introduce our next two doctors and panelists for today's meeting. Thank you. So I have the honor of of first introducing Dr. Vidya Prakash. Dr. Prakash is a professor of clinical internal medicine and infectious diseases faculty member at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. Dr. Prakash graduated from the Ohio State University with a bachelor's of arts in English. She received a MD, her medical degree from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Then she went on to complete her internal medicine residency followed by infectious diseases fellowship at the San Antonio Uniform Services Health Education Consortium. After serving as an infectious diseases physician in the United States Air Force for 10 years on active duty status, she retired from the military in 2014 and joined SIU School of Medicine. Dr. Prakash serves 
as Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs and Chair of the Clinical Competency Committee in the Department of Internal Medicine. She is the founder and director of SIU Medicine's Alliance for Women in Medicine and Science. Um, she also serves as a chair of the Health and Healthcare Committee, the Illinois Council on Women and Girls, as chair of the Illinois Department of Public Health Diversity and Healthcare Task Force. And she is also the chair of the American Medical Women's Association Rural Health Committee and is the director of diversity and inclusion and the director of AMWA's membership committee. She currently lives in Springfield, Illinois with her husband, Dr. Eric Black, and their children, Eric Shiva and Ethan Prakash. And next, I will introduce Dr. Vidya Sundaration. Dr. Sundaration is a professor of clinical medicine and chief of infectious diseases at SIU School of Medicine. She is the medical advisor to the Sangamon County Department of Public Health. During the last year, she has helped with the pandemic response in Sangamon County and within the SIU system. Dr. Sundaration participates in many work groups for COVID with the Illinois Department of Public Health and recently took over as governor of the Illinois South chapter for the American College Physicians. Dr. Sundaration is a graduate of Bang Bangalore University Medical School in India and received her master's in public health from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. She completed her residency in internal medicine at SIU School of Medicine in Springfield, Illinois, and fellowship in infectious diseases at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky. Dr. Sundaration enjoys theater, music, and dance in her spare time and loves to spend time with her family. Thank you, Dr. Grundy, and welcome to you both. You can go ahead and say something if you like. Um, I can't see everybody on the screen, so because of my PowerPoint. <laughs> I'm just really excited to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you for Thank being a part. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, it's such an honor to uh, uh, share the platform with Dr. Ziki and Dr. Arnold uh, uh, and Dr. Pakash. True honor. Well, th this is Dr. Arnold. I, I don't want to uh, put out a lot of accolades in the beginning, but Dr. Ziki has been doing a stellar job in her position as a director. Uh, the state is moving towards herd immunity at a rapid pace. And we are, you know, I'm just glad and grateful to have this opportunity to speak with uh, my colleagues who are all very, very uh, well versed and uh, stellar uh, physicians as uh, has been noted in the introductions. Well, I have to continue the love fest <laughs> <laughs> and say, you know, Dr. Arnold had this role before I ever uh, thought about it. Um, and so I have had wonderful uh, shoes to try to fill in. So thank you, Dr. Arnold, for your continued uh, mentorship and, and tutelage. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so it's now time to get down to the nitty gritty and let's talk COVID. So um, I will check with my co-hosts to see if they have any questions in. Otherwise, we have taken the time to collect some questions from some of our community members that they've already asked about. Um, surprisingly, we've had people all over the state and actually in different areas in different states uh, send in questions ahead of time. So um, if we don't have a lot of people who have the nerve to speak up or don't, then I can always share some of those questions first. But I'll give everyone else on the, on the meeting a, a chance to do that first. And Amber and Cheryl, I may need you because I, like I said, my visibility of the screen and the questions in the chat, I've got, I've had so much stuff pulled up. I don't know what I'm looking at anymore. Natalie, right now, I do not see any questions from participants in the chat or the Q&A boxes. It looks like um, Heather Green has her hand raised. Okay, I am going to unmute you, Heather, because um, I know that you're involved very much so with NAACP. So let me just get to the list really quickly and I can get you reassigned. I see you. And now you're allowed to talk. <laughs> it's not a power and control thing. We just didn't know how many people would actually participate. So we're trying oh, to keep no. it controlled. No, that absolutely, I understand. I, this is not my first Zoom, so that is very... You got an, an advantage when you can mute everyone. Um, 
first, I just wanted to say that my name is Heather Green. I uh, represent the Indo Alexander Pulaski NAACP. I am the healthcare chair. Um, and I just want to put that the NAACP has um, reformulated their website um, to show their new uh, program of COVID no more, K-N-O-W, in order to get to where there is no and oh, COVID. Um, and so there, there are other resources, statistics, other town halls with um, medical personnel on it um, and other information specific to certain populations. So that, I just wanna make sure that everyone uh, knows that that is available now um, as a resource. Um, now, I actually had one of the questions, uh, Natalie, that you did um, uh, submit earlier and I just kinda wanted to expand upon it. Um, what is the difference between the Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson vaccines? And are there any populations that any one of those is better for? Awesome question. I will, I don't know how to choose. The doctor, one. yeah, with one of, okay. Dr. Prakash. I can begin. So um, I can take the two mRNA vaccines, if that's okay. Um, so Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA vaccines. So what happens is that when you get the injection, they're injecting manufactured mRNA into your body. It goes to your cell and it tells your cell to make a protein. Um, and it's similar to the spike protein, um, which we see on the actual virus. And what happens is that if this is your cell, it makes the spike protein and the spike protein sits on top of your cell. And what it does is it signals your body to get ready, to get the troops ready, to fight off the real infection when it comes. Um, and once it's done doing its job, the, the um, actual mRNA disintegrates, the body gets rid of it. It doesn't linger around in your system at all. And at no time does it integrate into your cellular DNA. That's important. That's a myth that I have heard over and over again it is absolutely not true. It does not in any way mess with your cellular DNA. Um, I'm happy to um, have anybody else talk about the adenovirus uh, vector vaccine with the Johnson & Johnson. Okay, uh, well, this is Dr. Arnold, but, oh, Dr. Ziki. <laughs> sure, I, I mean, just briefly the J&J &J vaccine works similarly, but it's a, a slightly different uh, technology. It is a viral uh, vector vaccine. So it does use a modified version of a, of a harmless virus, the adenovirus. And so that adenovirus is the, the carrier or the vector that contains a piece, uh, you know, a little stretch uh, of genetic material so that, again, you stimulate the troops you know, to action. Again, you're not bringing the actual uh, virus that causes COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you're not bringing that actual virus into your, into your body, but you're stimulating your, your body's immune response to uh, recognize uh, the real virus when it comes. And so it will trigger, you know, alert the troops and fight off the infection when it sees it after being trained with this uh, viral vector vaccine. A couple of differences between the two, uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, the two mRNA vaccines are for um, are two doses and they're actually varying amount of times between the Pfizer is three weeks apart for the two doses. The uh, uh, Moderna vaccine is spaced by a minimum of four weeks and the Johnson & Johnson, uh, one of the reasons that it can be quite popular is because it's a single, a single dose. So when you hear that people, you know, the vi the vaccine made them sick. So what you're saying is that no, it's your body priming itself, getting ready for that, for the um the if it ever encounters the virus. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, and one thing I, you know, I will, you know, they uh, give me once an hour, once in a while between my schedule. It's a very dangerous thing to do with me. Um, so I have a tennis ball at home. So. What I did is I started putting push pins in it and I made the virus. This is what the virus looks like. 
And, you know, those are the proteins they were talking about. So each one of these little purple spikes and uh, the antibodies we developed actually attach those and they take this virus out of our system. Mm -hmm. All all three vaccines are very effective. Um, There are some uh, things that the CDC mentioned uh, with the uh, Johnson and Johnson vaccine uh, for women less than 50 years old. You know, uh, you know, you can uh, do an alternative, but uh, the incidence of having any kinds of complications from a very uh, small, uh, pretty rare. Mm-hmm. But some people are concerned, and they, you know, if that's a reason for doing it, look at Moderna. You know, uh, look at uh, Pfizer, and uh, you will uh, have a good vaccine. But the safety and efficacy of all three of them are really very, very, very high. We are so. Uh, uh, bowled over by how effective these uh, viruses and vaccines are and how they've kept people out of the hospital, off of ventilators, and from dying. Mm-hmm. So we have another question. How do individuals know what vaccine is best for them? Can can really, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Ziki. No, no, we, we don't have a, a priority or this is the, the favored one, you know, um, I, I received the Pfizer, the governor received J&J, you know, other members of his cabinet received the Moderna. So we're just excited to have not one, not two, but three, you know, safe and effective vaccines that are readily available for everyone in the state to get as soon as possible. So, you know, if you have uh, any further, you know, detailed questions, you know, for sure, talk about it with your doctor. 90 to 95% of all physicians have been vaccinated, you know, and so they can tell you why they were vaccinated and can, you know, continue to discuss with you why you should be as well. And so I think there's a question in the chat. It says some women are claiming that the vaccination has been changing their menstrual cycle. Is there any truth to that? And so you, you mentioned that they should follow up with their physician. Or have you heard of that? Or is there any truth in that and how they address that concern? Yeah, I I have not heard that. I have not seen literature. I don't know if any of the doctors have seen something about that. This is the first that I'm hearing of that. I haven't either. I haven't either. And it may be some other factors also. uh, You know, when you have anecdotal stories from one or two people, you have to be very careful about the timing of it because it could be other things. The stress that we're all going through with this Mm -hmm. 19 nightmare we're in, uh, you know, the impact on families with family members being lost to this virus unnecessarily. And, you know, I wish we had this uh, vaccine back in this uh, in December of 2019 and everyone was vaccinated. We would have had over 600,000 people, more than a half a million people still alive. So that's why the vaccine is so important. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have another question if it's okay. So um, earlier this week, I had a full-time paramedic from Springfield, Illinois call, and he was vaccinated the second week of January. One week, exactly one week later, he was diagnosed with COVID-19. So he went to his doctor and said, okay, I got vaccinated and then I turned out to be positive. What should I do? His doctor told him that he should not go back to get his second dose, that he should wait on a booster. So his question is, is he fully vaccinated? Because one, the first step he was vaccinated with the first uh, dose and it was Moderna. And then he was positive for COVID-19. Yeah, so the CDC uh, guidelines would say, no, he's not fully vaccinated. You know, we know that even individuals who have had COVID, we still recommend each of the people, uh, even who've had COVID to go on and get the full vaccination and that's two doses for Moderna. So he's received one dose, he needs to get the second and he can still get that now. He does not need to start all over because it's been you know, several months in between doses. He can still just pick up and get that second dose. I agree, Dr. Azike, and I will add, you know, they have this great data for both Moderna and Pfizer that it's 95% effective. That's after two doses. That's not with just one dose. So if you want full efficacy, you really need the second dose. And I'd also like to add that, uh, you know, between the two doses and sometime even two weeks post the second dose, 
um, you have to wait two weeks after the second dose is completed for to, to be considered fully vaccinated. And we have people who may contract COVID even in that time, uh, but but that really um, does not account for fully being vaccinated. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. It is important that we stress that we probably should have said that at the outset that there is there is no chance for the Moderna vaccine to have given him COVID. He already was incubating, you know, with that with that infection, but just didn't know it. We that's the reason that we have the quarantine period that can be ten or fourteen days because you can get exposed to someone with COVID and that they actually, you know, have shared COVID with you, but it takes. It can take five days, 10 days, up to 14 days for you to develop the symptoms of the infection. So he clearly had been infected, you know, before, and it took, you know, some days for him to see it. And in the meantime, he had gotten that first dose of vaccine. Okay, that's great. Um, so there's a question in the chat. It says, what are the statistics on fully vaccinated people later being infected with COVID? Um, you all addressed this, that you, someone had to be incubating, but do are there any statistics that talks about people who have been infected after getting the vaccination? Yeah, so we do, uh, we're keeping track of, you know, what we call uh, vaccine breakthroughs. And so we have to remember again that, you know, we're, I mean, the flu vaccine, we think about it being 40 or 50% efficacious. So to have something in the 90s, you know, between the three of them over 90%, not just in the clinical trials, but in real life is amazing. But even at 93% average for those three vaccines, that means it's not 100%. That means that maybe 10% of people might not get the full immune protection that, you know, that was sought after. And so there is the possibility that there are people that will go on and still still get the disease. Uh, we think that obviously because of the vaccine, they're likely to have less severe courses. Uh, but there are some who, if they didn't get the immune protection, if it just didn't take, whether it's that they're on immunosuppressives, they're on certain medicines that interfere with the ability to develop that immune protection, or if they have, you know, uh, if they have active cancer or some kind of immunodeficiency, they're different things that might make the vaccine not work. And there's nothing on, you're not gonna illuminate and there's not a sign that will tell you that you're one of those people. So yes, there are people who might go on uh, to, get the, to get the illness, um, but very rare, it should be, you know, less than, less than 10%. Uh, there's some uh, CDC data from uh, the preliminary vaccinations that they had. After giving 64 million doses, they uh, saw that in real time, the vaccines actually outperformed what was even being studied in the clinical trials. Out of 64 million doses, there were only 5,800 people that actually were found to have COVID as after vaccination. Out of those, only 7% needed uh, hospitalization. And deaths for minimal. So, so that that there itself tells how effective these vaccines are. And so, is the next question is: Is there a specific time period of time you need to wait before getting vaccinated after having COVID? Uh, it's yeah. Usually, it's up. Yeah, usually it's about uh, you know fourteen days after it. Um, but you have to be, you know, symptom free, um, and it's there are some standards that they have uh, from the CDC. You know, you should be in quarantine, quarantine um, if you do have the illness and staying away from other people. But generally, after you have uh, fully recovered, um, uh, they recommend that you can go forward and get the uh, vaccination. There was some initially uh, some thought around, well, you know, do you have to wait three months? Do you have to wait six months? You know, and no, that's not the case. So usually it's uh, about uh, two weeks after you've fully recovered from uh, being ill. And uh, also, uh, if you are going to get a vaccination, uh, it's good to let your provider know that you're coming in for one if you are feeling sick or, you know, just to let them know that protects the other people and the patients and the staff of the uh, provider's office as well. I agree, Dr. Arnold, and I would add, if you were sick and you got the any of the monoclonal antibodies, you have to wait at least 90 days. That that's that's the one exception. 
is, is the 90 day rule if you've been given that type of medication. Dr. Prakash, could you describe what those antibodies, what are those antibodies? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's, it's basically, um, I, I think the, the easiest way to talk about it is um, helping your immune system, basically. Um, so giving you immune support um, to help combat the, the virus. Uh, and I think that's the simplest way that I can describe monoclonal antibodies. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have another question. As far as the, this question is about, how do you explain this to skeptical people? Um, best way to explain about getting the vaccine. And then specifically, they talked about the black community as far as letting their guard down about the vac about receiving the vaccination, the vaccine. Um, well, we've done a lot of work and Dr. Zeki has been, you know, really uh, pushing the Office of Minority Health um, and even men's health to, to get out there because there's also a decrease in men actually getting vaccinated, uh, less than what we'd like to see. But um, overall, if you look at the African-American community, uh, there's some uh, myths uh, and misconceptions that are out there or just misinformation that's being propagated in the media. Uh, for, for one example, uh, there was one uh, site that I saw that said that there were um, uh, that, that, that these men were uh, unjustly treated with the Tuskegee uh, experiment um, and that uh, this happened in Alabama back in 1932 to 1972, this, uh, this group was followed and that um, what a terrible shame, how horrible they uh, uh, did these men. And, uh, you know, so that's why you should not get vaccinated. And there was actually a healthcare professional who responded to that and said, um, yeah, I learned about that when I was in uh, health studies and what a terrible thing that happened. And then another person came on and said, oh, uh, that's why I'm not going to get vaccinated. And I'm not going to even get tested. Uh, the travesty with that is, is that uh, there were 17,600 followers on that email, on that, that uh, website. And so those people got all kinds of misinformation. First of all, the men who were in that were not part of a, an experiment. They were part of a clinical study. In other words, they were not given anything, any kind of uh, injection with syphilis, as, uh, as, as she was mentioning. Uh, they were not, uh, they were just followed um, as a case control study. And uh, as a result, they did not receive penicillin. So if you want to put yourself in the same position as those men who were in the Tuskegee study, if you don't take the COVID-19 uh, vaccine or protect yourself, you're actually not allowing yourself to get access to a treatment uh, or to a, you know something that can prevent disease, uh, similar to what was going on with those uh, men in the Tuskegee study who did not get penicillin to treat their syphilis. They actually subsequently went on to develop you know uh, quaternary syphilis stage four and pass it on to generations to come. So this is something that we really really have to understand is that a lot of myths and misconceptions are out there. Get your information from reliable sources like those the doctors on this uh, talk today uh, from the CDC website, IDPH website. They have a wonderful website that has information that gives you reliable information, but too many people are playing witch doctor out there, which can uh, end up destroying lives and families. Thank you for that clarification, Dr. Arnold. That was really one of the questions that we have received as well. Dr. Grundy, I'll let you take the next question. Okay, okay. And so I guess I'll skip to this one along those lines. Um, there is a young woman, she is a community outreach coordinator for Southern Seven, Shauna Ryan. And she says she's getting calls at the health department that patients are concerned about being injected with a chip. She said, of course, she doesn't believe that, but that is a genuine concern of many people in the region um, and asked if you all could address that. Yeah. Oh, I, I, it's pretty prevalent, this idea. And, you know, I, and I, I would be concerned, too, if I thought that the vaccine would put a chip in me and maybe be monitoring me or, you know, monitoring my thoughts. And, you know, if we're really concerned about that, then, you know, the, the devices that that do that are actually our cell phones. I don't know how many times you've been talking and then all of a sudden something pops up an ad about something you were just talking about or, or there's a, a new you know, notification that's 
absolutely connected to a conversation that we just had. So if you're very concerned about people monitoring you and eavesdropping, throw away your cell phones because that's where the monitoring devices are happening. But there are no chips in the vaccine. Uh, um, there never has been. Uh, and really there are, you know, your Alexa devices, Siri, all of those are the ones you might be concerned about if that's a problem. I find that fascinating. Can I just tell you, I would love to know the history behind where that started um, because it's just so off the charts, I think, um, as far as people's imaginations <laughs> really going wild. Um, but yeah, I, I agree, Dr. Azike. And I agree with totally with Dr. Zike. You know, throw away your cell phone, throw away your credit card. <laughs> they know where you are. <laughs> uh, the cameras all over the place downtown on buildings. <laughs> so that that is not so a concern. And uh, unfortunately, that that you know that kind of uh, thinking and it, some people believe in things uh, that aren't really there. Um, and I always tell you know students, it's like remember you know science never asks for you to believe in it, but it's incredibly unforgiving if you do not. So, you know, you can walk off the edge of a cliff or believe something that leads you to the edge of a cliff and take a step and, you know, gravity doesn't care whether you believe or not on the way down, but you will be a believer at the end. So don't let this uh, not taking the vaccine uh, be one of those things or microchips or, you know, hidden uh, messages be the thing that takes you off the edge of that cliff and succumb to this disease. So uh, make sure you protect yourself and do the right thing. <laughs> I mean, the truth is that for, for, uh, African Americans, we do have a significant problem because we have seen the burden of the disease borne very heavily on the African American community. And so having, we still have, wait, for most of the population, the rates are going down. It is only in the Black population that the rates are still going up. And then when you couple that with the fact that the Black, we have the lowest vaccination rate as well, having the lowest vaccination rate and the highest infection rates, that, that's a recipe for nothing that we should be trying to cook up. So we really have to get away from the misinformation that's costing us our lives, literally, because there are people who have, everyone has access to this vaccine right now. There's a pharmacy near you. There's a mass vaccination site. There's a pop-up clinic. There's a religious institution. There's a, a, a mall. There's something within just a few miles of everyone and to not to pass it up and then unfortunately get COVID thereafter and not have a favorable course. It's, it's really a tragedy. It's really a tragedy. And so we've already seen very high rates uh, of death. Mortality rates are higher in, in Blacks than they are in the white population. And to reverse that, we have to take advantage of this life-saving resource that can really decrease the chance of death. We have seen that we have almost, almost no cases compared to the amount of cases that we had in our nursing homes around the state. And the reason that we have almost no cases, we, at a peak, we had 3,000 cases per week in the nursing homes across the state. This last week, we had 134. And the difference is that all of those individuals got vaccinated. The vaccination rate in the long-term care facilities, our, our skilled you know, nursing facilities, our assisted livings was 90 plus percent. You know, Their guardians, they themselves said, no, I need this. And that is why we're not seeing infections happen there like it did when there was no, no preventive measure. So let's take advantage of that and protect ourselves and our loved ones. If you did get vaccinated, it's not enough just to say I'm protected, make sure you encourage 10 of your loved ones to do the same. Thank you so much, Dr. ZK. Um, I know my, my family, my mother, father, my 90 year old grandmother, they got their vaccination at Southern Seven Health Department. So, you know, if you can be vaccinated, please go get your vaccination. So thank you. Um, I did also want to add um, to, to this discussion around the fears around the vaccine. So we hopefully, you know, took care of some of the myths around the microchip um, and the fact that it doesn't mess with your DNA. And even with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it's not going to replicate in your system. So you're not going to get adenovirus from this vaccine. That's another misconception. But the other big one that I hear about is, you know, with the whole um, 
blood clots with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. If you put it in perspective, out of 7 million doses, there were 15 cases. So let's put it in perspective. Okay, the, the likelihood of that happening is so, so low and the benefits of the vaccination far outweigh the risks. And if you look at really bad reactions from the vaccine, it's one, I think the statistic is one in two to five million, you know, that, that you're gonna have a severe reaction. The likelihood of getting a bad reaction from penicillin is so much higher, one in 10,000. So if you're a numbers person, pay attention to the numbers. What I can't emphasize enough is that the benefits of this life-saving vaccination far, far, far outweigh the risks, far outweigh the risks. And I also wanted to add um, to what Dr. Azike was noting in the nursing homes. Now, if you look at the curves of um, or the graphs of how uh, COVID is manifesting in the communities, um, in at the outset of uh, the pandemic, we would see people who are um, older um, get ill. And now as they are vaccinated, you see the curve kind of move down towards those who are not vaccinated. So, so that in itself is also a visual of, of how uh, vaccination is affecting, what's happening, how the disease presents, and, and what's happening in the community uh, with transmission. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to also say that, uh, you know, when we get vaccinated, uh, we get vaccinated for our families. We are building a immunity wall around our families, our communities, our place of work. So vaccination is really important. So someone asked about, can you touch on how important it is for us to continue to vaccinate even though the numbers are improving? It's, it's critically important to do that. And, and there's, there's several reasons. First of all, those people who are not vaccinated are still at risk uh, themselves personally. But what also is going on in the background is that we have variants now. You know, we have the United Kingdom variant, the South uh, African variant, the Brazilian variant, Californian variant, New York variant. Uh, so there are multiple variants out there. But so what we've seen so far is that these vaccines are still very effective against even the variant strains. Um, so what we're worried about is those people who are allowing this virus to smolder, to stay around longer than it's necessary when we have an effective uh, vaccine that can prevent it from spreading from person to person and extinguish it. And uh, the problem is as long as those a virus state that virus stays around it has the potential to mutate again, and we don't know what form that's going to take in the future. So you have a, not only a personal responsibility, you have a humanitarian responsibility, um, making sure that that uh, virus is actually uh, taken away from all of us. Uh, so you have a really a deep role to play in it. And one thing that uh, Dr. Prakash mentioned earlier uh, is, you know, uh, when I got vaccinated. Uh, the first time I had a little bit of soreness in my left arm. And then I tell people I had, uh, you know, after the second dose, I had a lot of pain in my right arm. That's because I ran into a doorway. I was running for a Zoom meeting and actually I got the same vaccination in the left side. <laughs> I had no problem with my left shoulder, but my right shoulder was the one who was giving me the pain. <laughs> so that was just me running and doing the wrong thing. <laughs> but I, I really did not have, uh, you know, anything uh, that was major at all. I mean, just a little bit of soreness in the arm, which went away in about a day and a half. Um, and when uh, Dr. Prakash was mentioning it, what made me think about that was that you are uh, actually, without being vaccinated, playing a game uh, you know, a dice game. So, you know, if you do get COVID-19, the vaccine may make you soft for a day or two, make you feel under the weather. Some people do feel a little bit uh, sicker for about a day and a half, but they recover. And the problem is, is that that's a trade-off for being on a ventilator for six weeks. Which one would you rather have? Be hospitalized, be on a ventilator for six weeks, fighting for your life, or wait for, have a little soreness for a day and a half? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer to me. I, I mean, I would rather make sure I fully protect myself and my family, um, as was mentioned uh, earlier. You know, Dr. Arnold, I am so happy um, that you brought that up because I think it also touches on the important point of we are so focused on numbers as far as deaths, right, um, or in the ICU. So a lot of people will ask, well, what's the big deal? I'll just get COVID and I'll recover and I'll have natural immunity. We are seeing so many cases of long haulers. So 
people who may not even have been admitted to the hospital who recover are having symptoms for over 12 weeks. So for months and months, they are struggling with shortness of breath. They are struggling with memory problems. They are struggling with heart palpitations, profound fatigue, even uh, joint pains. Um, so this can result in really debilitating symptoms that really affect your quality of life. Um, and so it's yet another reason to get vaccinated. Sure, you can get COVID and you can survive, but your quality of life can go down considerably. And we're seeing this in, in a pretty large group of patients. Yeah, I'm gonna add something really quickly to that. And then Dr. Zeka and wants to speak as well. But you know, one, one of the things I've been concerned about from the beginning is people with chronic disease, kidney disease, heart disease, brain disease, uh, lung disease, and liver disease. We're seeing things where this disease, this COVID-19, which is caused, caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes uh, co you know, coronavirus disease of 2019, but that disease actually impacts the same, very same blood vessels that are involved in cr uh, chronic diseases. So we're seeing blood clots form. We're seeing people with arrhythmias in the heart. We're seeing people with a more advancing kidney disease. Um, it, there was one uh, particular person who testified, uh, you know, in front of the uh, FDA for the approval for uh, Moderna. And he said, I'm here not as a doctor, although I'm an intensive care unit doctor, I'm here as a patient because I got COVID-19. And as a result, I used to be an ultra marathoner. I used to uh, work out every day. Now, after being on the ventilator for over, over two months, I, have, I can't even walk a block because I'm short of breath. I have uh, high blood pressure for the first time in my life. I never had this before in arrhythmias that they're trying to control with multiple medications. He said they're even looking at my kidney function, whether that is still up to snuff. So uh, we don't know how this virus is going to affect those people with underlying chronic medical conditions like CO, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or asthma. Um, you know, down the road. So uh, be careful. Even if you're young, we don't know if this is going to cause a chronic medical condition in you. Uh, even though you're young, you're not invincible. That's what I found out when I got older. I wasn't invincible when I was young back then. <laughs> uh, but, but that's something that you really, really need to uh, pay attention to, that this is not over by any stretch if we uh, have people who are succumbing to this virus who have chronic medical conditions. I'm going to turn it to Dr. Zike. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Arnold. So one situation that just came up with a, uh, with a colleague uh, that I work with, um, a, she has a young child, uh, age three, who's in daycare. And so she has got the call just yesterday that one of the other daycare children uh, tested positive for COVID. And so not only does this affect that child, the child got it from the mother, the mother uh, got COVID. Of course, the mother had the chance to get vaccinated, chose not to, developed COVID, had the child tested after the child developed symptoms. The three-year-old child in daycare is positive. And so now all the other nine children in that daycare class all have to go home and quarantine for at least 10 days. So all of those children now, all of those families now have to figure out okay, can I work? Can I not work? I now can't take my kid to daycare. One of the parents, if there are two parents in the home, somebody has to watch this child. So because somebody didn't want to get vaccinated, that's impacted dozens of other people, you know, nine other families who can't go to daycare now that maybe could impact their, their job if they don't have paid time off because, you know, of one infection. So there are significant repercussions to all of our actions. There are repercussions to us not, you know, wearing our mask if we're supposed to, and there are repercussions to us not getting vaccinated. Uh, in addition to, you know, potential hospitalization or worse, long hauler syndrome and disrupting many other people's lives. Wow, thank you all. That's, that's so important and it does show how it does kind of trigger and affect everybody. We have some more questions. Dr. Grundy, can you read the questions in the chat, please? <laughs> 
I sure can. Um, we have a question from um, Faith Miller, who's also my sorority sister. Um, she um, said that she's read and heard that when you do get the vaccine and possibly develop symptoms, that you will continue to test positive even when you are no lim longer symptomatic. Can you please expound? We do know that in certain cases, I know in the beginning, we were we were you know learning about the virus and trying to see how long people would test positive for so you know you can test positive by you know by saliva by you know nasal swabs even by stool well after the acute infection has passed it's not clear exactly how long it takes for it to stop for you to stop testing positive and that's really why uh, the recommendations change that you don't test to you don't keep testing to show that you're not infected. We think that you know after your symptoms cleared and after you know ten days or so, you know you you are likely not infectious. And if you continue to test, the test might um, suggest that you're still infectious when you're actually not. So I, I just to explain that a little bit, the uh, PCR process, which is the test that they do a polymerase chain reaction test, what that does is it can even pick up dead virus. So, uh, you know, uh, the virus can uh, be dead and still be in the nasopharynx or saliva, like Dr. ZK was mentioning, um, and um, uh, urine stool, uh, multiple um, uh, 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 isolates can actually uh, show that the virus is there. And when you uh, use this test, even a small amount of virus, it kind of cycles it so many times that it is capable of picking up even very, very small uh, amounts of viruses. So uh, that's the reason why the test can be positive for a long time after uh, somebody gets COVID and is even over that acute phase of illness. Uh, and like Dr. Zeke was saying, first we thought it was 90 days, then they said 120, now even up to 150. So, so that's, that's still being studied to see um, uh, how, how uh, that can change with respect to the type of testing that's done and, and also uh, the type of infection. Thank you. Um, there's another question. How long once fully vaccinated are you protected to, um, from the virus? And I've also seen some questions about boosters. So if you all can kind of expound on that. Yeah, those are the, the million dollar questions. You know, like the question is, okay, like will this vaccine still be effective and protect me three years from now? Nobody knows that. Nobody has had the vaccine in them for three years. Nobody's had the vaccine in them for even a year and a half, where uh, maybe some of the trial participants are maybe getting close to a year, but really this is something that we'll have to see. Um, when we talk about boosters, you know, what are we really talking about? So we'll have to understand, you know, with, with research, with science, you know, is it that at a certain point of time, maybe a year and a half, maybe a year, whatever, two years, three years, that all of a sudden we're now getting infected and suggesting that, oh, okay, that immunity started to fade away, it waned, and now we need to go get that same vaccine? Or is it that we've had so many mutations that there's a new variant and that variant uh, is disrespecting our current vaccine immunity and doesn't care that we're uh, immunized with that vaccine and that we need a different vaccine that is specially tailored for this mutation, this variant that somehow has changed. So there are not answers to those questions, but we know in either situation, you know, if we need a booster, we have the vaccine and we can, you know, make more doses if we need to give everyone a booster. If we find out that the virus has changed so much that our current vaccine doesn't protect us, we know that that mRNA trend, uh, technology is very efficient and we can change that current mRNA vaccine and include uh, something that looks like this new variant and switch that out and create a new vaccine in much shorter time. The science, the researchers said that they could update a vaccine if there was a new deadly variant in as little as three months. So again, we don't know and we hope if we can really put our foot on this vaccine, on this virus, you know, we won't give it the chance to, to mutate into some horrible new variant that will require new vaccines, but that involves everyone participating in this vaccination effort. 
Yeah. Can I add one thing to that? And it, it really goes to what Dr. Ziki was just saying, is that, and this is a misconception we need to clear up, is that the vaccine was not rushed. It was done in the normal way that you produce a vaccine scientifically every step of the way, phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. And they have been following it with the adverse you know, vaccine events reporting system you know, uh, through the CDC and FDA. Uh, all the way through. So this rush, this vaccine was not rushed. What was changed is that we have telecommunication scientists operating on this thing all around the world. It's the most studied vaccine ever produced in the history of mankind, right? <laughs> it, it, it's the, the one that's being studied the most. And uh, so for people who are saying this thing was rushed, they got rid of some of the administrative roadblocks. They made sure all the funding was there up front. They didn't have to go through all kinds of congressional hearings and approvals and you know next step and next step. They uh, said that this is a, a, a public health emergency and we need all the scientists to work on this uh, and to make sure that we come up with a, um, we have now a godsend technology that's been around 20 years before we use it for this. And as Dr. Ziki was saying, it has given us the ability to adapt to changes in that virus uh, in a way that we did not have before. So um, if that, I just want to blow that sort of uh, misconception out of the water. I would also add, Dr. Arnold, it's also been studied in very diverse populations. So they were very intentional with studying it with respect to race, ethnicity, and gender diversity. So do you all think that the, man that the vaccine will become mandatory? So we've gotten that question a couple of times. I mean, obviously, those there are discussions. Um, I mean, they're mandatory in certain settings. I know there are some employers that are mandating it. Many colleges are mandating it. Um, at the state level, at the federal level, there haven't been any mandates yet. You know, um, but it's 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 being talked about. But uh, no plans at this time. No definitive plans. But again, there are many places where they will require that you know to participate in this event whether it's to come into a certain uh, public, um, a public event, it might be a, a concert, it might be an indoor venue, it might be a convention, it might be to get on a plane to go somewhere. There are many places that might make it required. Uh, we've already seen hundreds of schools, universities make it required for students that are coming to matriculate you know, on, on their campus. So um, again, nothing at the state level but many other private industries are, are making uh, some mandates around that. And so it looks like we're drawing near to the time to end. And so we can just end on one question. Um, as far as when do you think COVID-19 no longer will be a threat to the general public? And if each of you all can, um, starting with Dr. Prakash and Dr. Sundarashan and Dr. Arnold and in with Dr. Ezekiel, if you all can just kind of give your thoughts on when do you think COVID-19 will no longer be a threat to the general public? I mean, I, I think from my perspective, um, and I welcome thoughts from my colleagues, um, I think once we actually achieve herd immunity um, will be when it, it won't be considered as much of a threat. And by herd immunity, ideally that will be through mass vaccination. Um, because of all of the things that we talked about um, to prevent more deaths, to prevent more long hauler syndrome. Um, I, I think that's, that's where we are now. Are we making progress? Yes, um, but we're not there yet. Um, this question has been, uh, well, uh, mind boggling. Uh, but, uh, you know, I want to uh, make a mention of one thing that uh, we are a global village. So what happens outside of the United States uh, does kind of impact what happens um, here as well. Uh, there are countries which are uh, really surging at this point, um, really struggling to control COVID. Uh, there is people. There are people traveling. There's there's a lot of lot of uh, situations in terms of how much vaccination is available outside versus how many we are vaccinating here. So vaccination definitely is a game changer. 
Um, and the more people were able to get vaccinated, uh, the, the closer we would be uh, to the end of this pandemic. Uh, and the more people we get vaccinated, we don't have to worry about things like uh, variants and, and uh, other changes that the, the virus will, will, will have. Uh, the, the high rates of vaccination will be equipped, will, will equip us uh, to be able to deal with that. Uh, so, so definitely vaccination uh, and global rates of vaccination uh, would also be something to shoot for, for a, uh, to work towards the end of the pandemic. Uh, and, uh, you know, already CDC has uh, eased up on a lot of guidelines in terms of uh, wearing masks, social distancing. A um, lot of epidemiologists uh, study this a lot uh, to see in terms of uh, uh, how many people uh, need to have the antibody response to be able to um, get rid of those uh, social distancing guidelines or masking guidelines. And these are being very closely followed um, at CDC. So uh, definitely, I think that's, that's good news that, uh, you know, with vaccination, we're getting a lot of people who will have effective antibodies to combat with the virus. Um, and that will help us uh, kind of ease those guidelines and, and get uh, closer towards ending this pandemic. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, when will this end? Um, that's a very, very good question because um, many people who have, to, have not taken the uh, vaccine um, have come down with COVID-19. And as we were mentioning before, there's a long, you know, long haul of syndrome. Uh, we don't know how this is gonna affect people with chronic disease. So I think uh, things like public health need to be get more funding. I think research institutions like SIU need to get more funding. I think the local health departments need to get more funding. You see the common theme uh, because, uh, you know, in order to, to really address some of the repercussions of COVID-19, the mental health issues that have arisen from this, uh, there are multiple issues that are arising in the public health arena that need to uh, garner more resources and more funding in order to combat them. And we need to start doing that now we're not out of the woods once we say, okay, you're vaccinated and everything is done. Um, we need to make sure people get vaccinated. And I think we'll come out of this sooner rather than later as, uh, and it goes to the core of what Dr. Ezekiel was mentioning, how this can be so disruptive to your life and why is it important for you to get vaccinated? Uh, it's a very selfish thing sometimes not to get vaccinated because uh, then you affect other people and the reason, part of the reason why I got vaccinated is I was walking down the street and one day I thought, you know, I said, you know, I could walk by someone who's a man or a lady, right? Who's walking down the street and pass the virus onto them. And then they can go into a hospital to see their sick child, the child who has cancer, the child who's immunosuppressed. And because of my inability to follow the science, and to do rational things by getting vaccinated, I just caused the death of their child. I didn't want that on my conscience. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a community thing. It's not just an individual thing about me, me, me. It's about us, us, us. And we nearly, really need to make sure that people get vaccinated. The sooner that happens, the sooner we'll come out of this, but we still have to follow the science. You know, I said before, remember, you know, science doesn't ask for you to believe in it, but it's incredibly unforgiving if you do not. We need to make sure we still follow the science and listen to uh, great authorities like our uh, two esteemed doctors at SIU and Dr. Ezekiel who's leading the state's uh, efforts to combat this virus. Uh, so listen, listen, listen. It can save your life, your family's lives, your friends' lives. You know, um, and, and, and I couldn't have it on my conscience. I, had, I saw one clip and I'll say this really quickly, uh, but a, a lady who, had her father come to a uh, party and it was for a birthday party. And so she said, I want you at my birthday party. Uh, subsequent to that, he developed COVID-19 and died. That is on her conscience for the rest of her life. She said, I caused my father's death. Why didn't I have him vaccinated? Why wasn't I vaccinated myself because she got COVID-19 too? Yeah, no, I, I'm afraid that, um... COVID, uh, COVID in its current state in terms of it's dominating every headline and it's being uh, affecting everything that we do, how we work, play and live, you know, that, that 
for the state of Illinois, that, that will change soon. Um, but as uh, Dr. Sundaration said, like this is a global pandemic. We have other countries around the world that where we have had 60% uh, of people vaccinated, where they've had 3% of people vaccinated. There are some countries that haven't received a single shot in anyone in the country. So it's going to be with us and not to mention the the memories of the devastating effects will be with us for generations. People who have lost maybe one parent, two parents, who have lost their entire livelihoods, the mental health of this, you know, post, you know, this traumatic mass casualty event that we've gone through together, like that's going to take a while for us to recover from. So COVID is going to be with us and likely uh, it will never be gone, gone the way, you know, the way measles was for a while, um, but I think we will definitely get to the point, at least in the state of Illinois, where instead of us reporting, I think we had maybe 1,500 new cases and another dozen or two deaths, that maybe it'll be down to, you know, uh, a death in, in several days or maybe one death in a week. But there, I mean, SARS, which was, you know, SARS, MERS, those coronavirus illnesses, we still have cases of that. So it's not going away for good, but we're going to get it under control and we'll get it under control sooner if everyone works together as a single community and, and gets vaccinated and does what they have to do to be part of this all in Illinois group effort. Thank you all so, so much. So we have went over time and that's a good problem to have once again. I am going to launch a really quick poll. It's only three quick questions. So it's going to show up on your screen. And so I, I've allowed the panelists to answer. Thank you. That's our reality. <laughs> Okay, well, I think, Natalie, you have someone who wants to talk, <laughs> but I do. <laughs> yeah, okay. I just want to thank everyone. Thank our panelists. Thank you so much um, for, you know, speaking with us tonight and to answer a lot of unanswered questions. And I know we didn't get to all of the questions, um, so you can email Natalie um, and her email is, is on the screen and her number is on the screen um, if you have any unanswered questions. And also this also will be posted on Southern 7's Facebook page so that, you know, you can direct people who miss, who might have missed out tonight, um, that they can go and kind of get some of this good information that we received tonight. So um, just thank you so much um, to everyone and thank you for attending. Thank you all. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. I'm glad to see they have geniuses at SIU and at the <laughs> Southern Seven. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. We did it. Yeah. I think you're still recording. Stop recording. I know. And the attendees are still there. Hi, attendees. Oh, okay. We're still, still celebrating. That's just nothing Hi, wrong. Hi, mom. <laughs> Your mom is on there? <laughs> yes, she is. That's amazing. Yes, I think that went really, really well. So yeah. um, any attendees, like I said, if you're still on the call, feel free to email and uh, ask any questions. I'm going to get off of here. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>